So today, I want to talk about what I consider the most, I don't know, hated industry in our country. Maybe the most hated industry in history. An industry that throughout the last 2,000 years has been blamed for every crisis, every problem, every economic disaster. It's always their fault. And, and it's not just the industry. It's, it's the practitioners themselves have been demonized time and time again in, in, in our media, in our literature, in our songs, in our plays, in our movies, certainly in our movies. You know, Shakespeare wrote one of his most famous plays, The Merchant of Venice, on Shylock, the money lender. I'm talking about finance. I'm talking about financiers. Everywhere you look, finance is denounced. Finance, oh, these Wall Street guys, they're just greedy. They're just, you know, they'll commit fraud in a second. And they, and they cause every financial disaster we had, whether it was the Great Depression, the, the 2008 financial crisis, or whether it was, you know, they were thrown out of the temple by Jesus after all. For 2,000 years, since Jesus threw them out of the temple, we have blamed every financial crisis on financiers. Is that just? Is that right? How, do, how, how should we approach the whole area of finance? How should we judge whether finance is this evil industry? Because, because we've evaluated basically as evil. We regulate it. We regulate it extensively. Every aspect of banking, every aspect of, of investment banking, every aspect of finance today is controlled and regulated by the government. We don't trust them. We believe that if we left them alone, they would bring about disasters. They would cause major crises, and they would, they would destroy life as we know it. You know... In, uh, somebody did a, uh, a survey uh, a few years ago. It might have been quite a while ago, but I think it still holds. About who commits the most murders on television. Who commits the most murder murders on television. And, uh, and the result is overwhelming. Almost 50% of all the murders on television and our TV shows are committed by businessmen. And a significant percentage of those happen to be in the area of finance. We don't trust business. But we certainly don't trust finance. As I mentioned, Shylock is one of the most famous villains in, in theater. Uh, Dante, I don't know if you've ever read Dante's Inferno. But the moneylender, the banker, is like on the seventh rung of hell. He's got a bag of money around his neck and the bag is being drawn downwards towards the fire dragging him into the deepest pit of hell. These are horrible, evil people. And we need, we need to control them. We need to tell them what loans to give out. We need to tell them how much interest to charge. We need to tell them, you know, what kind of products to sell and what they can and cannot do. We need to have say into every single part of how they do their paperwork. And... You know, this is what we have today. We have an unbelievably regulated, controlled industry. And yet, and yet, if you think about it, if you think about the value of this industry, the value to human success, the value to human flourishing, the value to ability to live our lives, in almost every dimension, in almost every dimension, finance, financiers, Financial institutions, financial markets are crucial, essential for our ability to live well. And I don't know about you, but my standard of the good is, is individual human flourishing. Is does this thing, in this case, does this interest industry promote human success, promote the creation of wealth, promote flourishing? Living well, living as a human being well. And when you look at finance, 
everywhere you look, in every quarter that you look, what you see is finance helping start businesses, whether it's through venture capital or through banking, finance helping grow businesses, whether it's through debt or through bank loans or through allowing companies to go public or, or buying and selling their shares, financiers and bankers allowing us to buy homes we couldn't otherwise afford until we accumulated enough cash, which would take us 20, 30 years. But because of mortgages, we can now buy homes that we can complete, that we can afford over time and allowing us to do what I call consumption smoothing, buying stuff today that we will pay for tomorrow, credit cards. And we don't have to store all our cash, you know, you know, under the mattress, in a safe in our home. We can have it at the bank and conveniently use credit cards and checks, if anybody still uses checks. Now, electronically, we can transfer money. We buy our cars with debt provided us from bankers. Every aspect of our lives, our business lives, our personal lives, lives as producers, lives as consumers, every aspect is made possible by the existence of these financial institutions, these financial markets, and these financiers that we so, so, so love to hate. So what's going on? What's going on? Is my assessment of the value that financiers create in our lives right? What am I missing? Are these guys really the bad guys that our TV series, that our movies, that our literature, that our what do you call it, uh, um, drama, poetry, portray them to be? Is this really true? Which one makes sense? Because you can't have them both. You can't have contradictions. I mean, I used, to, I used to be a finance professor, so I know a little bit about this topic. And I used to teach a class called Finance and Ethics. And people used to look at me and say, wait a minute, that's a contradiction of terms. You can't have finance and ethics. Really? Really? We think that lowly of this profession that makes all the wealth we have around us possible to the extent that we don't believe it's compatible with ethics? Well, it's true. It's not compatible with a certain type of ethics. We're going to talk about that. Right? And I used to ask my students, this was their uh, first and most difficult homework assignment. I used to ask them to uh, go find a movie or book or novel where the hero in the movie or the novel was a financier. Not just any financier. Not some loser financier. But a successful financier. A financier who'd made a lot of money by being a financier by working in this profession. Made a lot of money, being successful, and portrayed in the movie positively. Or in the book. Now, this was the hardest homework assignment I gave these kids. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with it. Because it's hard to find anything. I'll, I'll give you an example of one or two. Well, it's positive, but and I'll give you some examples of negatives. But, you know, they, they really went out. One and, minute. And, and they really couldn't find anything that portrayed financiers. Now, you could find loser financiers who feel bad about all the money they made and then become good guys. You can find loser bankers like the hero in It's a Wonderful Life who runs an, a, a failed bank and is therefore the hero of the movie. But the successful banker in It's a Wonderful Life is a creep. 30. Is a really, really bad guy. Is somebody we love to hate. So you think. Think about a movie or a play or a TV series or anything. Any work of art. Any work of fiction that portrays bankers positively. All right. When we get back, 10, we'll talk about why nine, that is and, eight, and what the value of finance seven, really is. You're six, listening to the Run Book Show. Five, we'll be right back four, after this. Three. So today we're talking about finance. Ooh, everybody's going. We don't like those guys. 
And I actually um, am excited by the fact that I, I've got a book coming out about exactly this topic. Uh, and the book's out now. You can pre-order it on Amazon. It'll be out. Uh, you know, it'll be shipping in a few days. Uh, it's called in, in Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. Go to Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. And, uh, and it'd be great if you purchased it. And, you know, maybe when I come to your town and give a public talk, I'd be happy to sign it for you. But it's also going to be available on the Kindle. And I know eh, you can't really sign Kindles or iPads and stuff like that. But uh, I think you'll find the book interesting. There's no other book like it. Nobody else, nobody else out there will actually go out to defend finance, not just a uh, economic defense of, of finance, not only an explanation of how finance benefits us all economically, but an actual moral defense. Why being a financier is a noble profession. Wow, that's a pretty strong statement. Why Wall Street? Wall Street has problems. We'll get to that. But why Wall Street is always vilified, unjustifiably, for every problem, every crisis we ever have in this country. And really, this is, a, a to a large extent, a global phenomenon, but it more intensely felt here in the United States. And why we could not have the world we live in. We could not have the world we live in. And I'm talking about all the good things in the world we live in, because we could have all the bad stuff. We could not have all the good things that we live in, whether it's your iPhone or the nice home you live in or the computer you're using or anything, the furniture you have, the car that you're driving, without robust, healthy, functioning financial markets. And yet, you know, these guys are vilified. So... I was talking about It's a Wonderful Life. Think about that movie. You've probably all seen it. It's a classic Christmas movie. I consider it one of the most anti-American movies ever made, one of the most anti-capitalist movie ever, ever made, and certainly one of the most anti-finance movies ever made. Because the hero of the movie is a failed banker. He's a, he's a banker with a golden heart, which makes him a failed banker because he won't foreclose on people who won't pay back their loans. So he's subsidizing failure and he drives his bank into bankruptcy basically which is going to hurt his customers it doesn't help to lose money now we sympathize with him we like him because our culture has a very weird view of profit we resent profit we dislike profit and if somebody nobility is associated with not making money right the best people in the world, we think, are people who work for nonprofits. So here's a loser, not making money, losing money, but still helping people. That's how he got into trouble. That's how he lost money. He's obviously a good guy. We love him. Across the town, there's a banker who's been very successful, made a lot of money. Why? because he actually thinks about what kind of loans he issues. He only gives it to people who can pay him back, or he thinks he can pay him back. And when they can't pay him back, he actually forecloses on. He does what an owner of the bank is supposed to do. He actually runs his business as a business and makes money and makes a profit. We'll get back to him in a second and show why it's so essential that he does that and why that's actually virtuous. Now, the movie makes him out to be a scoundrel and he's a lying and a cheater and he steals and everything. But to make the point, to make the point that if you're a successful banker, you're a lying, cheating, stealing SOB. It's the loser, banker with a heart, who is the good guy, who is the nice guy. That's It's a Wonderful World, but you see this pattern repeated over and over and over again. Now, why is making a profit virtuous in the mortgage business? Let's take the mortgage business uh, for, for a second, right? Why was it a good thing that, I forget the guy's name, I forget the name of the villain in It's a Wonderful Life. You know, you, you get to a point where memory, memory is the first thing to go. But um, what is the, uh, what, what is it 
What is it that makes profit in that context actually virtuous? Right? Because we, we think of it in terms of, wait a minute, he's foreclosing on people. Yeah. People who have a loan, who've signed a contract, and who now, for whatever reason, fault of their own or not, or accident, or just bad luck, cannot pay it back. But who does he have a fiduciary responsibility to? To people who deposited money in the bank. People have opened checking, uh, saving accounts in the bank. They've given the bank money under the assumption that that money would be lent out and make a profit. And that that profit would partially pay to give them interest on their saving account. So people are saving with the expectation of a, getting a, a return. That return is generated from the return the bank gets on the loans that it makes, on the mortgages that it makes. If the bank stops taking in the return on the mortgages, it can't pay you interest on your saving account. Who loses? You lose. It might not even be able to pay you your principal back if the person they lent the money to can't repay it. And if you don't foreclose, foreclosure means you take over the house and you sell it. How are you going to get the principal back to pay the savers? So you're basically, this goody shooters banker, is basically sacrificing his depositors, sacrificing savers for the sake of people who can't pay back their mortgage. It's a contractual violation. It's a violation as a fiduciary duty. It's a disaster. Now, making money off the mortgages is what makes it possible for the banker to pay you interest on your saving. That's a good thing. And though saving, the fact that you're willing to save is what creates the mortgage markets. But if you start having bankers all over the place not foreclosing, letting the banks basically not be able to pay back savers, in a sense, driving their banks bankrupt, then not only do the savers lose, but mortgages in the future lose. The whole industry gets wiped out. And where, how do you fund your next home? Most of us don't spend our whole life putting money aside and then buying a home for cash. Luckily, there is a whole industry dedicated to the fact, to making it possible for us to actually purchase a home before we have enough cash to buy it. That's what a mortgage is. Wow. It raises a standard of living dramatically when you can buy a home that you're only going to be able to accumulate enough money to purchase years from now. And by giving you a mortgage, making it possible for you to live in a nicer, bigger home than you could ever imagine. It's terrific. It's fantastic. And if you end up making more money than you expected, you can sell the home, pay back the mortgage, and get a mortgage on a bigger, nicer home. And if it turns out Things are not so good. You can sell the home, pay back the mortgage, and buy a smaller home. Wow. The flexibility. I mean, the way in which this simple little thing, this simple little financial product, this simple little financial institution called a mortgage bank has made your life better, every one of our lives better, by making it possible for us to buy and sell One minute. Homes, for us to live in homes, without having to worry about you know, putting the money aside. In the meantime, what are you doing? You're renting or you're living in a crummy home when you really want to live in a nice home. I love mortgages. I, I love debt generally. If you do it responsibly, if you use it responsibly, which a lot of people don't, but if you use it responsibly, it's incredibly life-enhancing. You can buy stuff and 30. pay for it later. You have to be responsible not to buy too much stuff that you can't afford to pay. But it's truly a beautiful thing. Think of your mortgage. Think of your car loan. Think of your other loans. All right. So in way it's a wonderful life, the villain is actually the good Ten, guy. And the good nine, guy is actually the villain. Eight, All right. Seven, You're listening six, to Ron Brooks Show. We're talking five, about finance, four, the morality of it. Three, and we'll be back two, after this one. break. All right, today we're talking about finance. We're talking about my new book, In Pursuit of Wealth, The Mall Case for Finance. It's co-authored with Don Watkins, who uh, 
This is our third book together. If you haven't got the first two books, you should go out and get them. Uh, Free Market Revolution is our first book. came out in 2012. And then in uh, 2016, we had Equal is Unfair. Equal is Unfair and Free Market Revolution. And now, the In Pursuit of Wealth, The Market for Finance. So get your Iran Brook and Don Watkins collection of uh, books. They good reads uh you know i think you'll enjoy i think you'll enjoy it and of course um you know i might i might even offer uh to uh, if you mail me the book i'll sign it and mail you back to you so uh, or, or if i come to your town and and give a talk happy to sign the book uh but but i, th- I think you'll enjoy it i think if you like the show if you like listening to the show i think you'll enjoy the book it's it's a book of essays the the in pursuit of wealth a book of essays that covers a variety of different issues related to the field of finance. Anything from what I'm talk, some of what I'm talking about today, kind of the moral case for finance, so breaking that up into two aspects of it. One is the, the, how finance contributes to human flourishing, how finance makes possible the ability of individuals to go out there and make their lives better and, and flourish and pursue happiness. Uh, also, why it is that financiers are doing something inherently self-interested, rationally self-interested. And to me, that is what morality ultimately is. It's the pursuit of your own rational, long-term self-interest, making your life the best life that it can be, living a flourishing, successful life. So the, the book has a chapter really just delving into that, into the productive nature of finance. It also does a bit of the history, history of finance. Why have we hated bankers so long? some examples of that hatred, some examples of the things they have made possible during that history, and how without financial institutions, we wouldn't have had all the economic progress we've had over the last four or 500 years, and certainly not over the last 200 years. We'll also talk about the fact that it's heavily regulated in the the book, and, and we'll talk about greed. We'll talk about Wall Street greed, good, bad, neutral, there's a chapter, and then there's a bunch of chapters, some about inequality is related to banking, some about luck, oh, bankers, they're just lucky, uh, some about, uh, you know, bad stuff that happens, and uh, about, it, we'll talk about CEO pay, and is, is it bad? We'll talk about, uh, you know, other, other issues that relate uh, to specifics, like insider trading, we talk about hedge funds, and uh, yeah, it's 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 an exciting book. It's um, you know, and I encourage you all encourage you all to uh, to buy it. Uh, it's called In Pursuit of Wealth: The Moral Case for Finance, and you can get it on Amazon as we speak, and in the weeks to come. All right, so uh, you know, and there's a long, by the way, there's a long epilogue in the book, which is just an interview with me covering all kinds of issues and all kinds of questions that come up you know what is a hedge fund why you know what is it that hedge funds do that that is uh that is even mildly productive there's a there's a chapter on central banking and bankers central bankers and so on you know we'll talk a little bit about central banking in a little while so a lot a lot a lot of information even if you think you know a lot about finance i think you'll gain something from uh from reading from reading this book. So we discussed a little bit how finance, banking, mortgages, debt, financing for us individuals makes our life easier. And and the flip side of that uh, is that a savers, it makes our life easier. We can actually now, because of banks, because of financial institutions, because of the industry, I can put money aside for retirement. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, I don't need to do that. I got Social Security. Well, you don't want to live off of Social Security. First of all, it's not a lot. Secondly, it might not exist, particularly if you're young. Social Security is, is going bankrupt. We'll do a show on Social Security, but Social Security is going bankrupt. So if you're uh, in your 20s or 30s, certainly if you're in your teens, I wouldn't count on it. Put some money aside. Save. And it's not just that you put money aside and it just sits there. I put $10 and then put another $10. Now I have $20. No, you put $10 in and it earns interest. Now, I know interest rates are pretty low right now. But you know, returns in the stock market have been pretty good the last few years. 
And there have been periods in the past where interest rates have been higher. And when you think about the compounding of those returns over many years, your money grows. If you do the math, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, I'm not in the business of uh, giving you financial advice or, or doing uh, self-help in finance, although I know there's a big industry of that, and I could probably make some money doing that. But let me give you this advice anyway. Save, save, save. It's the most important thing you'll do for yourself if, you th if you're a long-term thinker, and I think we should all be long-term thinkers. You, there are going to be emergencies. And you don't want to rely on the government for help for emergencies. You don't want to rely on your family for help for emergencies. If you save, if you build a little nest egg or whatever you want to call it, an emergency fund, you can take care of yourself in those emergencies. Retirement. You don't want to count on Social Security. You certainly don't want to count on your kids. Your kids are not going to fund you when you're, when you're old, right? That's, that's, how, that's how we used to do it. 300 years ago. The kids, kids would take care of you. No. You put money aside, you save it, and then you can spend it once you stop working, once you stop making a living for yourself. Save, save, save. You want to you buy a nicer computer. You want to buy a nicer home. You want to buy a, you know, a, a nicer automobile. Save, save, save. Saving is the way to do it. We, we focus so much on consumption. And buying stuff. And now economists, really, really bad economists in my view, keep telling us, oh, the economy is driven by consumption. No, it's not. No, it's not. Economic growth ultimately is driven by saving. It's driven by production, by building stuff, creating stuff, making a profit, or making income and spending only part of it, and then keeping the rest and investing in. It's the investment that allows factories to grow. It's the investment that allows startups to be created. It's the investment that creates the future jobs that are going to be created in the future. And investment is just the flip side of saving. You save by giving it to the bank or giving it to a hedge fund or giving it to a pension plan, and they invest the money so that they can give you a return on your saving so that you can one day buy that nicer car that house you've dreamt of, or just retire in much better condition than if you One had to minute. rely totally, 100%, on Social Security. So what really drives an economy is saving. Now, you shouldn't say because it drives the economy. This is the beauty. The beauty is that if we all act as individuals in our own long-term self-interest, this is one example of that, the economy benefits the economy benefits, the extent that there is such a thing as the economy. Job creation in the future 30. will benefit. New product creation in the future will benefit. So all you have to focus is what's good for you. What's good for you is to save and save and be diligent and disciplined about it. And by the way, you're also helping the economy. It's not why you should do it. You should do it for yourself. Ten. All right. We'll be back in uh, after this break. We'll be talking more about the morality Five, of finance. You're listening three, to the Run Brooks Show on the two, Blaze Radio Network. One. All right, today we're talking about my new book. My new book, In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance, co-authored with Don Watkins. And we talked about savings, and we've talked about investment a little bit, and we talked a lot about kind of using debt to fund some consumption. All good things, all wonderful things, and and this is great. And if you think about how how banking really started, I don't know if you know the history. Banking really started by people wanting to be able to store money, money, and money in those days was real money, none of this paper stuff that anybody can print anytime and just create out of thin air. Money was gold or silver, mostly gold. It was real. And you had to carry out all your gold. And you had to bury it in the ground. And, and it got difficult. And it got cumbersome. And it got risky. People could steal it from you. And, and there was no way to get recourse. How, how do you identify your gold versus somebody else's gold? So people started taking the gold that they had made, the gold that they had saved maybe, hoarded, 
and putting it up, stowing at the goldsmith. And the goldsmith would give you a little certificate, a little piece of paper saying, uh, I owe you X amount of gold. Right? And, and, and you would have the certificate. And somebody at some point, probably accidentally, uh, had the certificate and wanted to buy something and, and needed to use the certificate to go run to the uh, bank, in a sense, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, guy who was storing all the gold and get gold to buy the stuff. And he said, you know what? Let me ask the guy if, if I could use this piece of paper instead. And the guy said, yeah, I, I'll take the piece of paper. The guy took the piece of paper, right? The piece of paper said that, the, that, that this, uh, th this goldsmith owes X amount of gold. And that was the beginning of paper money with these IOUs. And it turned out that you could circulate these IOUs. And once in a while, people would go and withdraw their gold. But mostly, they kept the gold in the vault. And all that was needed was circulating the IOUs, these pieces of paper. Call it paper money. But every piece of paper was backed by gold in the vault. And, uh, you know, this... Uh, this is how money came into being, modern money, how paper money came into being. Basically came into being with these deposit receipts, right? IOU deposit receipts. And these deposit receipts became the money that was being used. Again, finance made life easier by instead of lugging around bags of gold or bars of gold, which are heavy, cumbersome, dangerous, risky, all you had to now carry were pieces of paper. Walk around with pieces of paper. Right? So even just at the very basic level of, 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 of a payment system, of our ability to pay for stuff, to buy stuff, or to take that money and invest it, which is what the goldsmith discovered. They had all this gold, right? And it was just sitting there. And then they figured out, okay, not that many people come and take the gold out. The deposit slips are just being transacted independently. We can take the gold and issue more deposit slips and give people loans. And now you got modern banking. All of this was kind of created out of the marketplace. All of it created out of the marketplace in order to make a profit. But the only way to make a profit in any industry, but certainly in the financial industry, the only way to make a profit is by providing a service that people want at a price they're willing to pay, which exceeds your costs of delivering it. So you cannot make money without making other people better off. You cannot make a profit without providing a service that people really desire and are willing to pay for. Now, you can short-term steal, lie, and cheat, but putting aside fraud, lying, stealing, cheating, all of that, profit is a reflection of how much value you have created for other people, the people who trade with you, the people who are transacting with you. Profit is this amazing, wonderful thing. And people who make a lot of money, a lot of profit, do it because they provided huge amount of value. They made people's lives better. This which is just, by the way. So... So let me just say, at every point in financial history, from those early goldsmiths to the creation of money, for, you know, paper money for the first time, to the building up of whole banking networks that made investments, to the complexity of the financial industry today, at every one of those steps, value was being created. Lives were being made better. At every one of those steps, Every one of those steps. Financiers could only make a profit by making, by trading with people around them, by providing services to people around them, services that those people really, really desired and were willing to pay for. And by the way, at every one of those steps, financiers were being demonized, were being uh, often criminalized, sometimes burnt at the stake, sometimes put in jail, but generally victimized. I and mean, never, historically, until this book, really, have never 
receive the kind of credit, the economic credit, the moral credit, most importantly, the moral credit for making the world a better place, for filling our world with wonderful, wonderful products and goods and everything. Again, everything is being touched by finance. You can't build a hospital without finance. You can't build a school without bonds that are financed by somebody, without a banker in the middle. At every point, everything that we do in life, one minute, these people touch. And again, we vilify them, we harass them, we condemn them, we prosecute them, we put them in jail, often put them in jail. Ah, frustrating, frustrating. So, and yet, here they are. They've created this immense value. And they keep creating the value because there's money to be made. They're doing it for self-interested reasons. They're doing it in order to make a profit. 30. Yay for profit. Yay for self-interest. If what self-interest and profit do is improve my world, if they enhance human flourishing, then I am all for that. All right. You are listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network. That was our number one. Ten. We will be back to discuss more about finance when we come back. One. All right. You are listening to your own book show. We're talking today about my new book, In Pursuit of Wealth, with uh, Don Watkins, my co-author. We've This is our third book together. In Pursuit of Wealth, the moral case for finance. I know some some people's heads are spinning. How can finance be moral? Finance is all about the pursuit of profit. And yeah, the pursuit of profit is moral. The pursuit of profit is good. The pursuit of profit is what leads to all of the successes we have in the material world around us. So don't slam profit. Profit is good. Profit is moral. Profit is virtuous. The pursuit of profit is good. It's when people start lying, stealing, cheating, committing fraud. But we've always had laws against fraud. We don't need new laws against fraud. Bernie Madoff is not self-interested. Bernie Madoff is just a creep. Bernie Madoff is the guy who uh, had that pyramid scheme and basically stole 50-something billion dollars uh, from people. He didn't really even steal it for himself. He just, he just defrauded people. The huge pyramid scheme. It's all wasted. It, most of it was gone. A lot of it was returned to people. But the guy's a massive crook. But he's not, he's not a financier. He's a fraudster. You don't blame the whole field of finance for the actions of one fraudster, which is what he was. All right. But people are bewildered, right? Okay, so they get saving, and they get the creation of money, and they get, they get maybe um, you know some loans, mortgages, some business loans. But it can be. What, what, that, what is the productive function of a stock market? You know, why, well, how is a stock market productive? How does it add to my life? I don't own any stocks. So how, do, how, does, how does my life benefit from the existence of a stock market? Well, I mean, you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have the computer you have on your desk. You wouldn't have uh, the car that you're driving. You wouldn't have most of the products, particularly the more expensive ones, but, but also the cheaper ones. You, there would be no Procter & Gamble. There wouldn't be no Johnson & Johnson, all the big consumer goods companies where you buy your toilet paper and stuff like that without a stock market. A stock market is what makes it possible for companies to raise vast amounts of capital so that they can go out there and build substantial companies. And I know people say, oh, big business. We hate big business. But the fact is, the most of the good stuff we have is built by big business. And the most, if not all, small businesses want to be big businesses. And they will be big businesses if they succeed. They stay sm small businesses if they fail. But success means growth. Success means growth. It really does. So a small business, if it's going to be successful, it's going to become a big business. So I, I love big businesses. And think about all the goods and, and services that you get on a daily basis that you benefit from at prices that if you actually thought about how much it takes to 
make this thing uh, unbelievably cheap. And we get them easily, efficiently, quickly. Think about all the stuff you buy from Amazon. Amazon couldn't have built those warehouses, the infrastructure, the logistics, the variety of products without the capital that it raised when it went public, when it joined the stock market. The stock market is essential for raising large quantities of capital, a lot of money, so you can build plant, equipment, logistics, warehouses, and hire people, hire people. I mean, nobody goes to work saying, that's okay, I don't need to be paid. If the company makes money, I'll take a percent. I may be small, some small businesses function that way. But how many people would actually join an auto company if that were the case? How many people would actually join a biotech company where it takes 10 years before any profit is seen? No. Capital is raised. Salaries are paid. And if the company turns profitable, and if there's money left over after all the debts and everything else is paid off, then the shareholders make some money. Hopefully that's a lot. But they're the ones taking all the risk. So stock market facilitates raising large quantities of capital so that people can be employed, so that we can buy factories and machinery or warehouses and logistics in Amazon's case or software, you know, servers and everything else. You can have a thriving, successful economy. You can have a thriving, successful uh, 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 economy that creates jobs unless you have a thriving, successful stock market. And indeed, the fact that since Sarbanes-Oxley was passed, Sarbanes-Oxley was a law passed in 2002 by, uh, by Bush in a Republican House and a Republican Senate. It passed the Senate 98 to 0. One of the worst pieces of legislation in American history. Passed the Senate 98 to 0. Not one, not one conservative voted against it. It's probably cost the U.S. economy. I hate these kind of measures because you can't really tell. They always underestimate. But, but the estimates of economists are somewhere between one to one and a half trillion dollars. Trillion. That's with a T. Made the stock market a lot less efficient because it made it very expensive to go public. So a lot of companies are not going public. The number of IPOs, initial public offerings, has collapsed, gone down dramatically since 2002 hurt the U.S. economy. One of the reasons we have slow growth today is because we don't have enough companies going public and growing fast using those vast quantities of capital. And this has been going on for 15 years now. You'd think a Trump administration, Republican House and Senate would do away with something like that. Oh, no. No, no, no. God forbid we should actually get rid of any regulations, even as Republicans, right? Without a stock market, without a thriving IPO market, Without that kind of growth, without that kind of investment, without that kind of investment in capital, the economy is not going to grow very fast, and you, as an individual, are going to suffer. It hurts you, every one of us. Not only because our jobs might not be as productive as they could be, but because our neighbors, our friends, our family members are not as productive, but also because the economy is growing less, that means less innovation, that means uh, less new products. It means less cheaper products. It means a lower standard of living than we could have otherwise as an individual. It means job opportunities that we never had, that we can only imagine. And yet nobody cares. Nobody cares. We continue to vilify financial markets. Uh, Janet Yellen just a, a, a few weeks ago came out and said, oh, we can't do it with regulations. Don't do it with regulations because it's ultimately it's regulations that will save us from the next financial crisis because it was it was lack of regulation that caused the financial crisis. Well, we're going to talk about that after the uh, after the next break about whether financial or, or maybe actually the second half of the show today. But but we're going to talk about whether the financial crisis was caused by too little regulation. That's a bizarre, surrealistic claim, but that's what she holds it. But my point is. Stock markets, even though we want to regulate and control them because we don't get it, are incredibly valuable. But here's another way in which they're valuable people don't think about. When people trade in the stock market, they give a price to a particular stock. 
what that price reflects is the value of that company. And what that value reflects is what the market, what people in the market estimate to be its future cash flows. How profitable this company will be in the future. I'm talking here about economic profit. How profitable would we be in the future? It's saying this is a successful company, stock price declining, that's an unsuccessful company. To the One extent minute. that the market is right, and the market is very good at getting this stuff right, that is unbelievably important information to other participants in the market, often to the companies themselves. They don't know that the company or their industry is dying. Imagine when uh, the, the automobiles were first produced, you were in the buggy industry. You might have not known your industry was dying until you saw the stock price go down. And then you looked up and you started looking around and discovered Ready? there was an automobile industry. So what the stock market does is it helps allocate those resources towards the next big thing, automobiles, away from the dead, dying thing, buggies. It's a beautiful thing to allocate capital on a grand economy-wise scale to its best and most productive uses. Five. You're listening four, to Ron Book Show three, on the Blaze Radio two, Network. One. All right, today we're discussing financial markets and the morality of finance. And I, I, the last segment I talked about the stock market, I want to I reiterate this. One of the things the stock market does, and really all financial markets and institutions do, is they allocate capital across the economy. They choose winners and losers. They decide which industries are going to thrive and which industries are going to die. And how do they do that? What's the basis by which they do that? They do it based on what they think is going to be profitable and what they think is going to lose money in the future. Now, how do you make money in industry? By providing goods and services to customers. By creating new things that customers are going to want. You want those industries to grow. When do you lose money in business? When you're not providing services to your customers. When your customers don't are not willing to pay for the service and the product that you are offering them. In other words, when you're a drag, when you're not adding value, when you're not contributing to success, to growth, to human flourishing. So financial markets allocate capital to industries and, cap and companies that are going to or are already and are going to in the future because finance is primarily focused on the future. They're providing capital to industries and companies that are going to provide for human flourishing. And they're taking money away. They're driving the stock price down. They're not lending money to industries that are destroying or, or not providing for human flourishing. They're taking money away from buggies, which nobody's going to want because everybody's going to shift to automobiles and giving it to automobiles. During the 1980s in the United States, we were shutting down a lot of what's called the Rust Belt. And the reason was that American business was not competitive anymore in a lot of the heavy manufacturing. Other people could do it better. And what you saw is people coming in, selling off a lot of those assets, shutting them down, firing people, laying people off. And taking that capital and putting it into the future. A lot of capital, huge quantities of money flowed from the Rust Belt to Silicon Valley. This is the era where Apple was created, Microsoft was created and built up, IBM shifted completely, where uh, all the personal computer industry and ultimately the internet industry were all built. That took a lot of money. Where did that money come from? To a large extent. It came from shutting down the old industries that were not worth that much anymore. Shutting down the industries that were not providing a value, not providing a service, or where you could get the value, you could get that service cheaper, better somewhere else. And yes, people lost their jobs. And they had to get retrained. But you know what happened to their kids? Their kids didn't go into the steel business. Their kids didn't go into old manufacturing. Their kids figured it out and they went to Silicon Valley and got in computer engineering jobs, programming jobs. 
There are millions of jobs today that have to do with computers and games and technology generally that didn't exist 30 years ago. Those jobs were created because our economy was free enough, was flexible enough to reallocate capital from losing industries to winning industries. And we demonize that. We demonize that. We think that's horrible. But that's wrong. That's how economic progress happens. That's what makes human flourishing possible. It's not holding on to that buggy plant or to that, I don't know, steel business. It's not profitable anymore. You got to take your capital and put it into something that is profitable because that profit, again, represents value creation, making people's lives better, human flourishing. And that's, that's what happened here in the 1980s. Uh, you know, people ask me, you know, that in the 1970s, if you go back to the 1970s, the, the U.S. economy was struggling. U.S. businesses were struggling badly. We had massive conglomerates, inefficient, unproductive. We couldn't compete with the Japanese. We couldn't compete with anybody. We had, high, we had inflation in the U.S. We had stagflation. Unemployment was 13, 14, 15 percent. And inflation was 15 percent. It was a terrible time. And then by the time we got to the 90s, we suddenly had low inflation. We had an incredibly robust, lean, efficient, productive businesses in America, hiring like crazy. Economic growth had accelerated. In the 70s to the 90s, how did that happen? In the 80s, what happened? What happened in the 80s is we had the restructuring of America. We had financiers like Michael Milken, like Carl Icahn, like the hostile takeover artists, go into companies and restructure them, sell losing assets in order to invest in winning assets, move capital from poor uses to excellent uses, and therefore, yes, create, create unemployment in a sense of firing people, but unemployment during the 80s plummeted. It went down dramatically. Why? Because when you allocate capital efficiently, more jobs are created than are being destroyed. So more opportunities are created, more opportunities to build, to create, to make stuff, to flourish, to succeed. So people used to ask me in the 90s when I was a finance professor, used to say, who's responsible for the good economy we have? Is it Bill Clinton? Is it Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve? And I said, no. It's never a politician, and it certainly is not a central banker. What made the 1990s, what made American industry lean and efficient and successful and growing, what made Silicon Valley, but what made all of American companies so successful were people like Mike Milken. That's who made America great again. <laughs> and that's the only thing that can make America great again. It's to free up businessmen, and most importantly, of all businessmen, is to free up financial markets so they can more efficiently allocate capital, more efficiently kill off losing businesses, losing industries, and fertilize, fertilize growth industries, the future industries. This is exactly what happened in the 80s. Shut down the Rust Belt, grew. Silicon Valley, and not just Silicon Valley, but all the places around the country where technology and technology companies have thrived and the people who support technology companies have thrived. It was all made possible because of this obscure thing called reallocation of capital, which financiers and the private equity and the hedge fund business in the stock market make possible, make possible. And having the stock price reflect the real value of the company is incredibly important so that the rest of the market knows where to allocate capital to. It's an incredibly powerful tool of valuation to, and, and a value of something. The financial value of something reflects its future potential, reflects its potential to be successful or not in the future. A stock price that's going down means that that company's prospects for the future are declining. A stock price going up means that the company 
prospects for the future are getting better. We want stock prices to be reflective of that information. To do that, we, want, we need a free market in finance. We need financiers who are incentivized and motivated One minute. to buy and sell, to, 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 to invest, but also to short. Shorting is, is a form of selling stocks. So that whatever they think about the future of these companies, that they do the research and discover new information and discover new facts about them, can be reflected in the price and make the markets more efficient and therefore make the allocation of capital more efficient, which leads to more jobs, more economic 30. growth, new industries, and the kind of human flourishing that the world makes possible. All right, um, we're talking today about my new book. In Pursuit of Wealth with my co-author, Don Watkins. It's available on Amazon and everywhere else. Uh, the Ten. Mall, mall case for finance. And we'll be right back to talk more Five, after this break. Four. All right, we're talking today about the mall case for finance. For finance. And I've been giving you a bunch of different arguments about how productive finance, financial markets are and, and, uh, and so on and how they allocate capital and why that's all a good thing. I, I want to talk a little bit about a different aspect of finance now. And then I want to talk about uh, the financial crisis, the Great Depression, and all, all the things blamed on finance. And we're not going to get into, we're not going to be able to cover everything today. I mean, uh, after all, uh, I have a six-hour course that I did years ago about the financial, uh, financial crisis, where I analyzed the financial crisis from A to Z. Six hours it took me, so we're not going to be able to do it in a few minutes that we have left on the show. But... In the book, we cover a lot of this. So again, I encourage you to go out and buy the book, In Pursuit of Wealth, The Mall Case for Finance, with me, Yaron Brook, and Don Watkins, my co-author. The other aspect of finance is its ability to reduce risk or to allow us to control risk. In a sense, to take on only the risks that we want to take on. Now, this is somewhat hard stuff. It's complicated, uh, and, and uh, this is why people get so confused about this, and I think why people are scared of it, and why people want the government to come in and help them, because they're scared. This is the whole area of derivatives, derivatives, options and futures, and uh, collateralized debt obligations, and uh, credit default swaps, and on and on and on it goes, the, the kind of different types of derivatives they are. But I'm here to tell you, they're not that complicated, and they're all good. They basically serve one purpose, these derivatives, and that is to protect, to, to cover the downside. All of these derivatives in one way or another are forms of insurance. It's just like you and me, we all buy uh, life insurance or, or property insurance or, you know, if, if, you know, flood insurance, fire insurance in order to protect the downside, and we hope we'll never need them, derivatives are the same thing. Derivatives are a way to protect us from downside. Now, for most of us, insurance is enough. Insurance covers the kind of risks that, we'll, you know, that, are, that, that our house will, will, will uh, flood or, or be destroyed by a tornado or something like that. You know, uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to any of us, but... Uh, we know what that risk is, and, and we can go, and there's a whole business called insurance that covers that risk. Now, notice insurance is a financial industry. It's a financial industry whose responsibility is to help you protect yourself from risk. And there are all these insurance products. We buy uh, health insurance and life insurance and property insurance and all this stuff. And, and now notice, again, from the financial perspective, all these insurance companies have to make money on the, on the premiums that you send them in order to be able to finance you when something bad happens. And the way, they make, the way they make money is by investing that money. And thus, by investing the money, they're adding to production because they are financing new plants and equipment and new jobs and, and, and new industries. That's what insurance companies do with the money. They, it might be in bonds. It might be in, in stocks, but they are investing. Even, you know, in some cases, they can even invest in hedge funds. So 
the insurance business is a great financial business, important financial business, crucial financial business, that protects individuals and businesses from a certain type of risk. But there are other types of risk that are harder, that you can't use straight insurance kind of products. And that's what derivatives were created for. And the simplest derivative to imagine or to, or to explain is a futures contract on, let's say, a barrel of oil. So an oil refinery produces barrels of oil. But the price fluctuates a lot from $100 a barrel to 50 to 20 even, back up to 100 It goes up and down. And what the producer would like to do is, is, is cap that price. It's, it, 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 you know, it's going to be producing oil over the next year, but it doesn't know the price at which it can sell a barrel in a year. But let's say it wants to make an investment, and it would like to know how much oil, at what price it can sell oil in the future. It can sell a future. It can, in a sense, ask somebody to guarantee the price. So I come along and I say, you know what? I'm willing to pay you 80 bucks in a year for any oil you produce. And I'm taking the risk that the price might drop to 50, but I'm also, there's also the possibility it might go up to 120. So I'm basically betting that the price is going to go up and the oil refinery is betting that the price will go down. And we're both coming together, mutually agreeable, and agreeing on 80. I protected the risk of the price going up. Let's say, you know, I own a fleet of trucks. And I'm worried about all prices going up. So I've just locked in a price for oil. I can now price all my deliveries based on this price that I've locked in. And the oil, co and the oil company has locked in a price that they know they can sell it at. So if the price goes down, then I'll worry. Both of us are happy. What's interesting is that if the oil price goes to 20 and I bought the oil for 80, I'm going to feel like I was screwed, even though I wasn't. If the price goes to 120 and the oil company locked in a price of 80, they're going to feel like they were screwed. But you know what? They're adults. And they understand that what they really did was buy an insurance policy. And sometimes you buy an insurance policy and your house doesn't burn down. So you feel like you've wasted money. But no, what you bought is peace of mind. What you bought is certainty about the future. That's what derivatives allow companies to do. You can now swap loans. You can swap interest rates. You can do all kinds of fancy things. But the essential characteristic is you're locking in payments in the future. You know how much something will cost you in the future. So you don't have to worry about it. You're creating peace of mind. You're reducing risk. You're making business decisions more rational by using these products called derivatives. And generally what that does is it makes the economy more efficient. It makes the economy more productive, which means more jobs, which means better jobs because productivity is going up. Jobs are allocated to the right kind of industries. We don't have these wide, huge, uh, good times and then crash bad times. Again, if, if the markets were free, we'll get, to, we'll get to that in a minute. What causes financial crises? Which I'll have to do a whole show on because I'm only going to get a, a short segment to discuss. But that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll do seven minutes on uh, boom and busts and why financiers are not at fault. So derivatives One minute. are not evil. They're good. We should celebrate derivatives. They make our economy more efficient. They make the economy more stable. And the more we regulate, the more we control them, as we'll see in a little bit, the less stable they will be, the less efficient the economy will be. So we want, we want companies, finance companies, regular companies, we want them to be in a position to reduce their risk make wiser investments. 30. And again, that's all derivatives do. All derivatives do. Now, yes, they can be used for gambling, but the gamblers lose and the gamblers get wiped out and what's left are the people who are using them to actually reduce risk and benefit enormously from them. All right. You're listening to the only defense of financiers you will ever hear on the radio 10. on the Iran Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right Money. back.
Bye. All right, today we're talking about financial markets. Financiers, is finance moral? And I've argued it is because it enhances human flourishing. It enhances individual human flourishing. And the people in finance are value creators. They make goods and services. They make products possible. They provide the financing that make it possible for us to live well, for companies to grow, for companies to start. There would be no Apple. There would be no Microsoft. There would be no Intel. There would be no Walmart without finance. None of the goods and services you have in the world around you without efficient, productive, good financial institutions and markets you wouldn't have. And if we hadn't regulated them, oh, we would be so much richer. The products we had would be so much better. Oh, no, you're on. That's impossible. Unregulated financial markets, that's what caused the financial crisis. Really? That, to me, is one of the most bizarre statements ever. And I hear it all the time. And Janet Yellen, the head of the Federal Reserve, said this recently. It's the lack of regulation that created the crisis. We need more regulation to prevent it. That is just nuts to me. Because in 2007, before the financial crisis, financial crisis started in 2008. Finance, banking, Wall Street were the most regulated industry in America. Every aspect of finance was regulated. Everything they did, they needed to get permission. So a financial crisis happened. How can you blame it on the lack of regulation where so much of what they did was regulated? I argue the exact opposite. I argue that in a, in, in a, in a fundamental sense, it was too much regulation. Indeed, regulation is what caused the financial crisis. And I'm going to give you a quick outline of this. You want more? Buy my book, In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. It actually has a whole section on the, on the financial crisis. The role the regulations played and the role the central bank played. And let me just quickly say this about central banking. Right? The number one product of finance is money. Money used to be private. Banks used to issue money based on the reserves that they had. You remember the story I told you earlier in the show about the goldsmiths. They would issue receipts, which served as money to their customers. That used to be money. And then at some point in the United States in 1913, 14, money was nationalized. Money was taken over by the government. And since then, the government decides how much money should be in the economy. Who should get it? Who should get it first? Who should get it last? The Federal Reserve is a government entity that monopolizes money. And it messes up constantly. It provided too little money, too little liquidity during the early 1930s and drove us, together with a few other factors, into a Great Depression. I know they still teach in high school that Wall Street caused the Great Depression, but it didn't. The Federal Reserve, along with a lot of bad decisions by Hoover and FDR, caused and sustained and perpetuated the Great Depression. Not perpetuated, sustained it for a long, long time. Could have been just a simple recession if they'd kept their hands off and if the Federal Reserve had behaved themselves and done the right thing. But it's hard to do the right thing when you're a central planner. Money should be private, but... Uh, that's a big, big topic we'll get to another time. Same thing happened in the Great Recession of 2008. In 2002, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to below the rate of inflation. And it kept it there for two and a half years. Now, when you have interest rates at below the rate of inflation, what are you doing? You're incentivizing people to take on debt, to borrow money like crazy. And we did, all of us. We all borrowed money like crazy because it was so cheap. It was insane not to borrow money. And we all borrowed money to buy one specific asset, housing. We took out all kinds of mortgages and usually variable rate mortgages at a really low interest rate. You remember the days of 1% variable rate mortgages, 5% down, 10% down? If you were really, really conservative, 20% down. But mostly, you could get 0% down some mortgages. Why mortgages? Because the government was heavily incentivizing that. Freddie and Fannie, the government institutions, 
We're subsidizing those mortgages and encouraging us to invest in those mortgages. And our politicians were telling us we should buy homes. We have housing policy at the federal government, housing policy that is geared towards maximizing the number of Americans who own their own house. Why is the government telling me where I should buy or rent? Why is the government telling me what house I should buy? Why is the government intervening in the rate of mortgages and what kind of mortgages and how much down we should put down? Why not let the market do its job? The market would have never done it this way. Zero down mortgages, not a market phenomenon. Interest rates below the rate of inflation, not a market phenomenon. Giving mortgages out to people who no way can afford those mortgages, not a market phenomenon. But what was happening was the banks were doing that, then taking the mortgages and selling them to government entities, Freddie and Fannie. And then Wall Street started competing with Freddie and Fannie. And why did they do that? That's kind of stupid. Because there was money to be made. Yeah, but if you do something stupid and you're in business, you know, then ultimately you'll go bankrupt. Oh, wait a minute, but that doesn't apply to Wall Street banks. If Wall Street banks do stupid things, take a lot of risk and make a lot of money, they get to keep all their money. But when they lose, when they go bankrupt, the government bails them out. It's called too big to fail. And now it's in our laws. Dodd-Frank institutionalizes too big to fail. So, so we have a system. Where banks are told, you're too big to fail, and we're going to bail you out One if you minute. get into trouble. Now, that's not free markets. That's not unregulated industry. That's a heavily regulated industry, heavily controlled, obviously heavily subsidized. Deposit insurance is a subsidy that banks get. And then we have to control them because we subsidize them and we give them too big to fail. So then we have to watch everything that they do and make sure they don't take too much risk. And we regulate and regulate and regulate and distort and pervert the incentives and make them do stupid things because we create incentives for them to do stupid things. And then we're shocked when they actually do the stupid things. That's what regulations do. That's what the Federal Reserve does. So what caused the financial crisis is Ten. stupid regulations, a lot of them, not any one, lots of them, primarily Five. regulations of housing and, Three, and Freddie and Fannie two, and the whole one. gamut of housing policies that incentivize us all. I mean, my, the woman who cuts my hair bought two investment houses. I mean, that's insanity, but it was subsidized by the government, so why not? And then when she couldn't pay the mortgages on them, she just walked away with no penalty. All of that is Break. insane. But that's government. And then the Federal Reserve, the people who control, have a monopoly over money, keeping interest rates way too low. But anyway, if you want to know more about the financial crisis and why it happened and why it was not a failure of capitalism, why it was not a failure of Wall Street, it was a failure of Washington, D.C. and government, read In Pursuit of Wealth, the Mall Case for Finance by myself and Don Watkins. It's available on Amazon. Go get your copy today. And keep on listening. This is the Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right. Cool. Sound good. Thank you. Of course. We will I'll talk to you on Sunday. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Bye.